Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. As promised, we're going to talk about data security. And we're going to talk about it from an M365 point of view. Obviously, that's where our expertise is. That's where a lot of organizations have data stored, both in documents, files, as well as email. And we're going to talk about it from a high level overview and focusing on data security and not data privacy, which, of course, are often in the same realm and they're related. But in this sense, we're mostly going to talk about from a data security point and not from how to keep things segmented from a privacy standpoint. Before we get started, I want to talk about sharing real quick because the legacy way of thinking about data security is mostly like, I'm just going to block sharing. We've talked about this on some of our external identity conversations and some of our conversations in the past about you know how to collaborate and share with other organizations. There are many different ways within M365 to control that sharing. From a general point of view, if you want to listen to our external identity show, you can hear Adam go on his famous rants about how, in general, we recommend allowing sharing natively through M365 and then controlling that data differently in ways that we'll talk about today. So just think like if you're blocking sharing, that's not really a way to protect your data. And also, I talked to an organization recently about keywords on email. So there is a legacy way to do this. Like if you're pinging off of keywords within a transport rule in exchange, and it's just exchange. If you're thinking about a transport rule, you can look at keywords in like the subject title or something like that of like an email and then encrypt it using the old school way of doing it, which is office message encryption or OME. That again is a legacy way. It's really not the way that we want to talk about data security and how to protect information from crossing barriers that you don't want to cross. So just from a high level overview, if you're using some sort of blocking from a file sharing standpoint, or if you're using office meshes encryption in a transport rule in the exchange admin center with some keywords. So like, Oh, if it has the word encrypt on it, we're going to encrypt it. That's a very, very legacy way of thinking about it. We're going to talk about a more modern, better way to approach this. As with anything security, the very, very first thing you need to do is understand what you own. You can't protect what you don't know exists. Just like with endpoints, you need to have some sort of sheet repository to list out all the endpoints you have. If you're trying to protect a network, you need to know what static IPs are assigned to different machines. With data security, you can't protect the data if you don't know what you have as far as sensitive data. So the very first thing you need to do is assess your data. You can start by confirming that your M365 audit log is enabled. You can also look at the compliance center and assess your compliance posture. That's compliance.microsoft.com. Now with licensing, this usually comes with M365 E3 or higher. So There may be some organizations out there who aren't, but the majority of enterprises with large number of users have at least E3 these days. So if you're not, you may need some licensing. So talk about that. You also need to know what data regulations apply to your organization. If you're a healthcare organization, I'm sure you know that HIPAA applies. If you do business in the European Union, you know that GDPR applies. If you're a publicly traded organization, you know that SOX applies. If you're in manufacturing, you may know that CMMC applies if you're doing business with defense organizations. So understanding what regulations apply will 
be key in how you secure and protect that data. There's multiple ways of built-in control mapping, versioning, and continuous control assessments for these different regulations that's built into the compliance center because some of these regulations change. We recently talked about the SEC and changing the way that reporting is for data breaches. You know, that news and those changing laws and regulations will show up in our compliance center and you'll be able to try to you'll be able to keep up with some of the new regulations that are coming out. Then you can gain a baseline, an initial compliance score just off of the baseline assessment that's built into Microsoft and then you can tweak it based on some of the regulations that might be relevant to your organization. And finally, when you're talking about data in general, it's usually not just an information security function, you need to start collaborating with some of your business units. So as you're spinning up this project and identifying data, you need to be able to work with, first off, policy, and usually that's done by legal or HR. You, you gotta work with those business units. And then if you have like an engineering department or an R&D department, they're the ones who really will have a lot of sensitive data. So depending on what industry you're in, what business units you have, you're going to need representation from each one of those business units as you're scoping up this project. Data security is not an information security function. It is an organization function. And so you need to have buy-in from leadership before you even start assessing your data. Know your data. That's step one in everything I've ever seen on this subject. Know what you have. I like the call out about knowing what compliance frameworks supply to your organization. You gave a good overview. Um, compliance manager is awesome. And there are some built-in functions available to everyone on E3. There are some paid functions that are available for E5 customers and even above and beyond that. So if you have multiple compliance frameworks, you need to measure your org against Compliance Manager is a great tool because what it will do is simplify your audit process because everything that we have visibility as Microsoft into, by the way, Andy and I both work for Microsoft, um, that will automatically be pulled and reported. So if there's like an, a setting and we want to know what the status of that setting is for this compliance framework, it'll pull that out and report on it and give you, you know, a go, no go on that. That's really helpful because then you can only spend your time worrying about the things that can't be pulled through automation or are in third-party tooling. So a huge time saver and as far as being compliant. Now, uh, overall, I, I think you touched on everything really well. I like you mentioned turn on the audit log. <laughs> you know, that's a great step as well. If you don't already have that turned on. And then finally, having that internal conversation around what is our classification taxonomy and how does that relate to both sensitivity labeling as well as retention labeling? How long do we keep something? When do we dispose of something? And what should be the controls around accessing something? Those are all really good things to understand. IT does none of that unilaterally. In fact, IT is just the implementer of that policy. It comes from elsewhere in the organization. Now there could be a collaborative process to create that and align it with the capabilities in the tools. But for the most part, this is when IT is getting their marching orders from somewhere else and you're just implementing a function of the business. You are helping the business do what they want to do when it comes to retention of data or disposition of data or protection of data. So have those conversations, get that in place first. And it is shocking how many organizations still do not have this in place. So if you do not, do not feel bad. You are not woefully behind. In fact, I would say very few orgs are really mature in this, which is why we're talking about it. And also when you're working with different business units, Oftentimes, they don't know what capabilities your organization owns from an IT aspect. Adam said that IT is the implementer. It's also IT's job to let the business know what we're capable of. 
like mm-hmm. how we can accomplish some of these things because they might not even have a concept of how some of this stuff works. They're just like, we don't want external data to do this. And you can be like, well, we also have this capability to protect it this way or prevent it this way. And that may change how they think of writing their policy. It should be collaborative. Great call out there. And I've seen this go sideways both ways where there's a, a process where it is dictated to it, go and do this thing. And it doesn't have the technical capability to do that. That's when we need to get back together and have a conversation about here's what we can do. On the other hand, we need to make sure that we're meeting our requirements. And if sometimes that requires us to go buy additional technology, so be it. That's our job is to meet these requirements and map technology to the requirements. So don't always let that get in the way either, because what I've seen organizations do sometimes in this space is they, they may not, for example, Microsoft has an extensive tool set here, but you generally have to be at the E5 level to have all of it. And if you need E5 functions, then go get them. They're available in many different bundles or different packages. There's not just one way to buy them, but instead of just being like, well, we don't have that, but it, it exists. It's a thing. It is possible. And if that allows you to best meet the requirement, then that's something again, where that collaborative process of, I understand that we need to do this thing. Here is the cost of us to be able to go do that thing. And a lot of times those stakeholders then will say, okay, you know, I, I'm not saying they'll just pull out the checkbook then and there, but there'll be a process to be like, okay, hey, if we need that technology and we've identified this as a requirement, then yes, we will invest in that. Sometimes IT, I see IT wrap themselves around the axle, trying to like build this Franken system of all these different pieces to work backwards towards requirement from the business and being afraid of just going to ask for money. And sometimes the answer is, hey, that's great. I can totally do that. I need more money to do that. And here's the cost. And here's why. Have that conversation instead of just trying to take it upon yourself and go stitch a whole bunch of weird stuff together because that's not supportable long term. So don't, don't be that guy or gal who tries to do it that way. The next thing to do is to identify your sensitive data. So once you have an idea of where your data is and your regulations, you need to identify the sensitive data. And Microsoft Purview, which is the overall compliance and information protection brand through Microsoft, can do this in multiple different ways. So you could have it manually identified by users. You can use some sort of automated pattern recognition for sensitive data types like social security numbers, credit card numbers, bank account numbers, and it can also be done through machine learning. Once you've identified that, you need to categorize the sensitive data into different categories. And from a high level overview, you may have multiple different buckets, but generally speaking, you have some sort of baseline business data, you have sensitive data, and then you also have highly regulated or classified data. So baseline data is just general emails back and forth. Me and Adam emailing about a customer meeting or something like that. Sensitive data may include some sort of numbers that may be sensitive if it got out. You know, if we're talking about a specific customer that is, we wouldn't want just anyone accessing that information. And then highly regulated, of course, is, you know, like financial data that's uh, or classified data, you know, government data or your, the proverbial Colonel Sanders, you know, 13 spices for the KFC recipe, stuff that like would make a huge difference if it got out. And so you need to categorize the data into that and then start creating Sensitivity labels, Adam talked about sensitivity labels. Those are ways to encrypt and protect that data as it flows. Now, with different licensing, you have different ways to label that. By default, with the E3 model, you have manual labeling. And so that does require a lot of education from the IT to the business on how that works because it's all manual. So if you have these buckets and then you have labels corresponding to these buckets, users then have a way
to label and protect that data based on what they think is the data. And so that's kind of the manual way of doing it. The important part about these sensitivity labels that is different from any other type of solution, we talk about encryption at rest and encryption and transit, as well as like full disk encryption. There's a lot of different types of quote unquote encryption. <laughs> the way that sensitive sensitivity labels work is encryption at the file level, which means that if that file is then transferred to a different source, uploaded to a different area, taken off and forwarded to some place that you don't have any control of, if it has that label on it, that protection travels with it. You can have a ton of different types of controls on that encryption, as well as like being able to lock it down to a certain domain, a certain group, a specific user, and you have options of having it be offline for a certain period of time. So if it's labeled, it does have to check in with M365 to check the authorization of that user who's trying to access it. And so if you allow it to be offline, wherever it is, it'll just be able to be accessed offline for a certain period of time. Let's say I do five days. After five days, it will require you to check in and re-authenticate as well as authorize that user who was authenticating to it. Does this person actually have access to this file? You can make that zero. You could say zero offline days, which means that every time it's accessed, it has to check the authentication and authorization of that user who's trying to access it. So a lot of different options there, but just know that the sensitivity labels is the key, at least from the start to manually start doing that. And then there are ways in the further licensing to automate that process. Great summary there. I'm going to add Adam's three <clears throat> commandments for sensitivity labeling. Number one, thou shalt not label everything as sensitive. All of your data is not sensitive. There is no organization that exists that has 100% sensitive data. If everything's sensitive, then nothing's sensitive. We know that old approach. I've had organizations try to do this and it fails spectacularly. Do not label everything as sensitive, which means do not encrypt everything. Number two, thou shalt require users to manually label documents on occasion. Automation is great. You should leverage the automation as much as you can to recognize potentially sensitive data and automatically mark it and classify it on behalf of your users. Think of that as guardrails. Guardrails keep the car on the road from going careening into the canyon below. However, you cannot drive down the road by just letting the guardrails keep the car on the road. You still have to turn the steering wheel and try to keep the car within the lanes. Those are just in case of bad scenarios. The same is true of sensitivity labeling. You must teach your users your labeling taxonomy. They must understand it. They must have leadership buy-in to enforce the usage of it, and it should be an expectation that whenever and wherever possible, they will attempt to select the correct sensitivity label on their own. Automation is guardrails. It is not the entire solution. Do not try to solve this all the way through automation. Again, I have seen that fail. It will not work. You must educate users. Number three. And I mentioned this earlier in the show, or maybe it was last week, whenever it was, there's that concept that more data is being created in the future than has been created in the past because our rate of data growth is expanding exponentially. Therefore, commandment number three, thou shalt start thy sensitivity labeling project looking forward. Do not worry about going back and touching all your previous data. There will be a time and a place to do that go back exercise. When you start, you draw the line in the sand and you say, from this point forward, you will mark things with the sensitivity label. So to summarize, number one, not everything is sensitive, which means you will not mark everything as sensitive. You will not encrypt everything. Number two, 
Users must manually label things from time to time. Do not try to skip this step. It is impossible to completely achieve this with automation alone. Humans are still way better judges of the sensitivity of something than our machines. And our technology is really darn good, but it's not that good. It doesn't replace a human. And number three, worry more about drawing that line in the sand and marking things moving forward than getting all of your archival data sensitivity labeled. There is a time and a place to do that. That is a worthwhile exercise. You should do that, but it's not the first thing you do. Once you've created familiarity and comfort with the process, that's when you can layer that in. I think we should carve those commandments into stone. Into a stone tablet. (laughs) The other thing I'll add real quick on that is that When users are manually selecting your labels, they're going to make mistakes. It's going to happen. They're going to label something as sensitive or too high and something will happen and people won't be able to see what it is. And that happens and it's okay. You should make that a learning moment and you do have the ability as admins for information protection within the compliance center to remove or downgrade a label. So controls to remediate that exists. But a good example of this is I actually self-recognized that I made a mistake recently where I was replying back to an email thread and I did one of those things that we have labels for where I didn't want our customer or external person to accidentally get replied to because they were on the original thread and if you had a reply all, it's easy to just make a mistake and have someone else on the thread when you're not supposed to. And I wanted to talk about something internal. I use the label of recipients only, which means that only the people that I replied to on that email would actually be able to see the contents of that email. And what happened throughout the thread was people wanted to add other Microsoft folks onto the thread to make them aware of what was going on. And they weren't able to because of the label that I put on there, which was recipients only. The proper label probably should have been, although in, it's always hindsight 2020 because you don't know how the thread's going to evolve. But in hindsight, the better label would have been FTE only or full-time employees only, which would allow anyone from Microsoft to be added on it at any point. So people make mistakes in sensitivity labeling. I made one recently, which I self-recognized. No one called it out to me, but someone probably could have you know, said, hey, Andy, like in the future, use this one instead. Um, and now I know, like next time I'll just use the FTE one. If it's not pertinent to the specific recipients on that particular email, I can just use Microsoft FTE. So mistakes will happen. People should learn from them. But like Adam said, don't use automation completely. You still need to allow your users to manually select what labels will apply to whatever sensitivity they feel like it needs to be at. The next part of protecting your data is data loss prevention or DLP. And you need to have policies for this. Now, DLP is kind of a loaded term in the information security space, but by default, kind of the way that I can explain it is think of signature based AV, right? You have those sensitive information types that are static that if it matches a certain expression, you can then apply a policy to it. So a social security number, for example, is always going to be three numbers followed by a dash, two numbers followed by a dash, and then four numbers. A telephone number is always going to be usually for a US, you may be an area code dash, three numbers, dash, four numbers. Certain banks have bank accounts, it may be like 16 digits with a dash in between. So once you have those types kind of scoped out and Microsoft has sensitive information types for so many different things. You can scope policies to them. The best way to do this is looking at the confidence level. So maybe it has to match the number format followed by maybe the word social or maybe the word security or something like that. And so that increases the confidence that this is actually something or a credit card followed by a credit card number followed by a dollar amount or something like that. So you can scope these policies for different confidence levels and then apply policy to them. Policies can take actions like 
applying one of the sensitivity labels on the fly, just because there's a DLP policy doesn't mean that you have to encrypt the data. But you can. You can use these sensitive sensitivity labels that you've already scoped out to allow users to manually do that along with DLP policies to detect certain things. Let's say you have a specific project that is very sensitive. And so Project Atom, if I have the word Project Atom next to it and it's super proprietary, it's very secret, I can then encrypt it on the fly with highly classified. So can't cut and paste, can't print, internal only, or maybe only to this specific M365 group. I could also allow the user to do that, maybe pop up a warning and say, hey, I see the words Project Atom here. This is a highly classified project. We recommend that you put the classified label on this. So you can have recommendations. You could force the label on there. You could block the file completely. Like if it's, if it has, and it, you know, with DLP policies, Microsoft is able to inspect the contents of like a word document if i try to upload that to somewhere else and it has the word project atom in it i could just straight up block and just say this contains sensitive information your policy says that you can't upload it or share it anywhere else and so we have dlp policies for both SaaS applications as well as endpoint if you're trying to transfer it from the endpoint to a usb it can take action that way as well. So let's, there's a lot of different ways that DLP can protect. Just think that that is the next step after you scope out manual labels and sensitivity labels and allow users to do it that way. Then start looking at DLP policies, endpoint DLP policies, where it can start with static ones that are built in, which we have hundreds of, and then you can do manual ones. There are ones that you can do with learning models and all sorts of different um, custom indicators that you can use as DLP policies as well. I had a peer of Andy's that I really liked how he explained DLP. And his example was data loss prevention is something that is triggered anytime data tries to cross a boundary. And there could be different boundary definitions. But for example, when I try to take a file that is stored internally in M365 and share it externally. So now I'm crossing that boundary from internal to external. A DLP policy can fire when I attempt to do that external sharing and then can take an appropriate response. And it can fire and then evaluate the content of the file and then make that response. And um, I thought that was a helpful guidance because then that applies to many different instances that could apply to, I have a file on my endpoint and I want to copy it to a USB drive. It's crossing that boundary from internal storage to external storage. You get the idea, dear listener. But I thought that was really helpful as, as far as thinking about something that fires when data is in transit and is crossing a boundary of some kind. That, in our mind, is what data loss prevention is for. And I thought Andy did a good job of explaining that all of the same sorts of things that can evaluate the content of a file when it's in motion for data loss prevention can also happen when data is at rest for sensitivity labeling and retention labeling. In fact, that concept is the same, that whole data classification service of having data be evaluated and look for those sensitive information types or matching a machine learning model or whatever, that can happen in any one of those instances. DLP is just an implementation of that in a specific scenario. And so when you really start to decouple all of these pieces apart, it gets more powerful because you can create something and reuse it in multiple instances. So you can create a sensitive information type that looks for, again, the basic example, social security number. And if it finds that, automatically apply the sensitivity label to it. But also, if this is an email that's attempting to cross, again, a boundary and leave our company, we're going to take this action on it. 
Those are two different things, data at rest, data in motion, but the classifier, the sensitive information type is exactly the same. And it works consistently across all of those use cases. So that's really, really, really helpful when you start to decouple all these things apart and you think of them as just implementations of the same technology, just in different scenarios. And that's kind of the Microsoft thought and approach to data loss prevention. And when Andy's peer explained it in that way, it kind of put that light bulb up over my head where I'd been talking about DLP for many years, but I never made the connection that the simplicity of the explanation, that it's just a rule set that triggers when data attempts to cross a boundary in motion. I thought that was really powerful. Anything else, it's not necessarily data loss prevention, it's something else. And it's adjacent to it, but it's not the same thing. And importantly, that boundary could be internal as well. In fact, I think it's a funny mm-hmm. story, which was I had a coworker who typed something into our Teams chat, and this is an internal Teams chat, it's Microsoft Teams, And some DLP policy triggered and deleted the message and said, this message doesn't conform to our DLP policy. And it was just a word. I can't remember what word it was, but it was just funny because he started typing and we're like, oh, you know, (laughs) big brother got you here and deleted the message. But it can be an internal thing. So if I'm copying a social security number into a Teams chat and say, here, here's my number or here's my password, right? Like randomized characters plus the word password might trigger a DLP policy. Like, okay, you shouldn't be posting that and they can just delete it or whatever action you want to take on it. So that information barrier that is getting crossed can be external, like sharing with an external person, email. It can also be internally. Good call out. I, I that's another good contextual concept to for me to remember is thinking about when I send data to you, even if it's internal to internal chat through teams, that's still like data is in motion. It's coming from me to you, Andy, and maybe there's certain things I don't want to be able to move from me to you and come through chat. And apparently whatever our coworker put in there was not something our company wants being sent through chat. Exactly. The final thing that I wanted to talk about is governing your M365 data. And Adam mentioned this in retention labels, but certain compliance and regulatory requirements may require you to have some sort of data lifecycle management. And so there's information governance that's built into the purview information protection platform that can help you address some of those compliance requirements, like if you have GDPR or CCPA or HIPAA regulations, there's lifecycle management and records management that you can use. Specifically, just to get started, there are retention labels that you can use that can keep data for a certain period of time. So let's say you want to make sure that data after three years or longer is no longer kept, like emails, you can do that through a retention label. And understand that retention of data is also a risk because if it's there, then it can be breached and it can be stolen. So if you don't have it and you don't need it anymore, retention labels and getting rid of data can be a way to quote unquote protect your data. And so that's also built in. There's a retention label, same kind of concept. You can scope them for years or days. You can have them automatically get deleted. You can have them trigger a lifecycle management review of how you want to take care of that data. But take a look at that. Um, it's under information governance within the compliance portal rather than information protection. Not only is retaining data a risk from an attack surface perspective, it's a risk from a legal perspective too. Anything you've retained can be subject to discovery during litigation. And I have had many an executive learn the hard way in companies I used to work for that, man, I wish I would have gone along with that retention policy you guys tried to put in because there's a lot of emails that would not have been there if they got rolled off after two years. So 
Um, eventually, everyone learns that retaining data is absolutely risky, and you should not retain it a second longer than you need to. I think that is another one of those sea changes that is happening in enterprise. More people are starting to turn that concept on its head, where it used to be, well, I better retain this in case I need it, to I better get rid of it unless I need it. Um, you are better off just getting rid of everything and... and y- as InfoSec professionals, we should be aligned with this, right? Like we don't want to keep anything a second longer than we need to, because that's all a tax service. That's all risk. Like if we don't have it, then we don't have to worry about it. And so that's something, um, you know, we can fight the good fight on that. And I think we're getting more allies in the broader enterprise space in, in terms of data handling and data management. And again, like we talked about in the beginning, retention policies generally are not IT functions. They're usually from legal because of litigation, or maybe you have a compliance org or privacy org that specializes in that particular regulation that needs to be followed. You need to work with them to find out what the policies are, how long you want to keep it for, and so on and so forth. So that collaboration is key when you're doing this data security project. The final thing I wanted to mention, and I'll give you a chance, Adam, to... to, give your final thought, but Microsoft Purview is across the platform and integrated with not only the unstructured data that we have in M365, but also structured data within the databases and tables in the Microsoft Cloud. So that universal classification engine that Adam talked about with that label, that you took the time to scope a sensitivity label, that can be applied across the platform and portfolio in the Microsoft Cloud and like SQL databases and other tables and data that you have that's structured data that can help protect it. You know, we talked about last week on the cost of a data breach and how structured data across multi-clouds is an issue. This can help you with that. So take the time to do that work up front and that label can tr- translate across the scope of the Microsoft suite. We must have been of the same mind. I was just going to add on the data lifecycle management piece. Retention labeling is often the least thought of part of this process, unless you have a strong regulatory requirement. I was going to say more or less the same thing you just said about structured data, which is, again, all this investment you make in creating these detection rules or working with the detection rules already in place can be leveraged there as well. So we talked about, I can create, again, this simple example, a social security number. I can detect that and automatically apply a sensitivity label. I can detect that and automatically fire a data loss prevention policy. I can also detect that and apply a retention label to it as well. They're all the same. And so that's the message I wanted to land there is as you build up these building blocks, you can keep reusing them across all those different scenarios. And that's really helpful. And that's an awesome call out for everything in like IaaS and PaaS platforms in particular, structured data sources. This story even extends there as well. And that might be kind of out of scope for today because I think we're running out of time, but that's something you can look into as well. I believe, what is that called nowadays? It's not Azure purview anymore. It's it used to be called that. <laughs> See, we yes. can't even keep up on names ourselves. Yes, it used to be called Azure Purview, but it might be something else now. Mm-hmm. But if you look that up, you'll find it. Finally, as we've been talking about this, if you're thinking like, holy cow, this is a lot of stuff. This data security project is massive. I don't have the personnel or the expertise Reach out to your Microsoft account team. We have really, really good partners in this space to help with this particular line of work. We have folks in security, but we also have really great partners who just focus on compliance and data security, data privacy. So take a look at that. If that's a concern, shouldn't stop you from starting that project today. I I love that call out, Andy, because... We work with a lot of partners. We just had Ascent Solutions on the show a couple weeks ago. They're a great security partner. I 
trust ascent with any of my customers to do great work. We have partners that are every bit as good in the compliance space as well, that are super strong. They speak the language of compliance focused folks in your environment. A lot of them come from like a legal background. They can speak legal with your legal people. And so they build a ton of rapport and respect and they're deeply, deeply trusted partners. The two top of mind for me, Epic Global and Lighthouse. And they're both fantastic partners. So if you need an introduction, reach out to your Microsoft account team. They'd be happy to connect you. We work with them all day long, all the time, and they can really, really help in this space. And in all honesty, you're only going to do this once. Hopefully they do it every day. And so that's where having that trusted partner, that trusted advisor to come in and say, I've done, I've done 20 of these this calendar year. Let me tell you about the pitfalls and the perils and the possibilities of what this could look like and how we can build this together. There's nobody better qualified to do that. So happy to make that introduction. And as I'm sure all your account teams would be. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or future topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.